Consulting Cooperative, Cooperative Development Services, and Food Co-op 500. My name is Marilyn Scholl, and I'm the manager of the CDS Consulting Cooperative. I know that many of you have participated in some of our other webinars, so I won't take a lot of time to introduce our organizations and the sponsors, but I would like to introduce Stuart Reed to say a few words about Food Co-op 500 and the uh, process that we'll be using today. Stuart? Thanks, Marilyn. Well, most of you uh, looking at the attendee list know who we are. We are an organization that has, was formed by people like the co -op, uh, consulting co-op that is presenting and helping to sponsor these, and NCGA, whose uh, marketing manager is doing the presentation today. We all work together for the future of the co-op world and hope that uh, what we provide for you is helpful and always open to your suggestions about how we can be of more assistance in, in your efforts. Today, as uh, Kelly presents her material and you have questions, feel free to enter them on your um, little screen, which is probably to the right, and there's a section for questions that you can open up. And uh, if you do that, we uh, you can type in your question. And as there is time during the presentation, I will provide those questions to Kelly for answers, or occasionally I'll answer them myself if, I, if it's something that uh, I can do without uh, stepping on anybody's toes or, or shortchanging you on good information. So that, that's what we're going to be doing, and I'll turn it back over to Marilyn. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and I want to uh, just briefly tell you about the last two webinars. Next week we will be presenting Hiring Your First General Manager with Carolee Coulter. That will be uh, January 21st, uh, same time, 1 o'clock Eastern Time on Wednesday. And then the following week, January 28th, Denise Chevalier with CDS Consulting Cooperative will present a uh, topic on project management. So we hope you are registered, and if not, will register and attend those two webinars. Um, and next, I want to thank Kelly Smith for joining us today. Kelly is the uh, Marketing Director of National Cooperative Grocers Association. NCGA is one of the partners in Food Co-op 500. And we very much appreciate you, Kelly, coming on today and sharing your expertise on helping uh, startup co-ops build their brand and promote their co-ops. So take it away, Kelly. OK, great. Thanks. Um, I really wanted to first just thank everybody for attending and for allowing me to come talk. I would invite anybody uh, to feel free to email me after this presentation if there's something that wasn't answered or if I can be of any assistance. Um, I will say that the presentation today is focused on branding. And the reason for that is because I think that developing a strong brand is really the cornerstone of any marketing and promotion that you uh, or your co-op will undertake. It's essential to understand how you're going to define your brand from the onset, because your brand is going to have meaning to consumers. And the only question is whether that brand is going to be intentional or accidental. So uh, that said, what we're going to cover today, get my here to go. Uh, four things. First, we'll talk about what is a brand, a quick overview of what a brand is and why it's important. Uh, talk a little bit about target markets and the importance of understanding who it is that you want to reach. Then we'll go into a little bit of detail about brand architecture. Uh, this is uh, maybe a little more detailed, but hopefully not too detailed. I want to give you an overview of some of the components of brand architecture so that you can think about um, how you want to define your brand. And then finally, we'll talk um, just briefly about the importance of execution. Uh, as you can imagine, marketing and promotion is a huge uh, subject with lots of different opinions. Um, not even close to covering everything today. Uh, but again, I'll do my best to, to give you an overview of these topics. So what is a brand? Uh, a lot of people think about a brand as a name or a logo. And while the name or logo may be the most commonly expressed and easiest element of a brand for people to comprehend, I cannot stress enough to you that your brand is more than your logo. It is everything that you do. Um, a brand creates value. It's a mix of both tangible and intangible attributes. So everything you do, from the products that you select and how you price them, to more 
intangible attributes like how your store feels to shoppers, the experiences that they have in your store, and the emotional associations that they make are going to combine to create what your brand is in the minds of consumers. If your store is clean and your staff is friendly, that's a part of your brand. If alternatively your store is poorly lit, if it's ill merchandised and staff are more focused on stocking than greeting customers, that's a part of your brand. So simply put, your brand is everything that you do and it's what consumers remember, how they think of you, not how you might want them to think. When you have a clear vision of your brand and you can execute it well, then what you want consumers to think and what they do think have a much better chance of being in alignment. So why brands? Obviously, branding differentiates you from competitors. It gives consumers a compelling reason to buy from you versus going down the road to another store. A strong, band, a strong brand fosters and maintains strong customer loyalty. And brands really work, um, I guess, as a shortcut for consumers and helps them make purchase decisions not only on what to buy, but in our case, what's really important is where to buy. So they serve as visual clues in the case of a logo, but also verbal and emotional cues that help uh, consumers distinguish between all of the many choices that they have to face on a daily basis and decide which brands they really want to invite into their lives and which ones they don't. Uh, strong brands are intentional. They're not accidental and they do require proper time and attention. Um, I'll, I'll say this later, but I'm going to say it probably several times during the presentation that you really need uh, to champion brand management at all levels of the organization and most especially at the senior level. Um, brands express your messages in ways that your customers can see and experience. So they incorporate all elements uh, of what you do as we mentioned before. Um, customer perception is reality. And once customers associate certain attributes with your brand, they tend to stick. And they're very hard to change. And trying to change them is very costly. So you know, associations can be a great thing, but it can be a large liability to you if it's either incorrect or negative. I'm sure that some of you are aware of, of some of the stereotypes that food co-ops have faced in the past, um, whether they're you know, hippie or counter culture or granola or so elite that you know you only have to be a member to shop. Um, many people are going to come into your co-op with preconceived notions about who and what you are. Or worse, be afraid to come in at all. Their first impression is going to make the biggest impact and is going to go the farthest to either dispel or support whatever those preconceived notions are. I, I, wanna, I can't emphasize enough to you that every employee is a part of your brand. Whether they're frontline staff or back office staff, everyone impacts how your brand is perceived. In fact, they're probably the element of your brand that consumers are going to interact with most frequently. And so if, for example, you want people to think about your co-op as one that provides great service, you have to ensure that you've defined what great service means, that you've educated and trained employees, and that you have mechanisms to ensure that that great service is executed at every level. So your brand position really has to be understood by everyone in the organization and permeate your culture in everything that you do. I wanted to give you an example of a strong brand, just you know, at least one that's a strong brand in my opinion, one of my favorites is Apple. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, certainly their logo is a part of their company's visual identity, but their brand means so much more. I don't know about you, but when I think about the Apple brand, some of the attributes that I associate associated with are words like creative, individualistic, hip, cutting edge, um, great experience, authentic. And some levels they're um, sort of the, the small guy for me or the little guy. I also tend to think about their sub-brands, uh, whether it's the iPhone or the iPod. There are so many positive associations with Apple that people actually aspire to purchase their products. And branding really doesn't get any better than that. So that's not to say that um, Apple and other strong brands don't have bumps in the road by anybody, like anybody else, but it is to say that their users are highly loyal as a result of their branding and delivery against what they promise. And as a result, their consumers 
are not only much more forgiving when issues arise and do the hard, you know, hard things come up, but because this company actually does both encourage and listen to feedback, their customers are much more likely to want to be a part of the solution. I'd also note that uh, if you know anything about Apple, they do not have the highest market share. Not everybody loves Apple or their products. They're not the biggest player on the block. But among their target market, and we'll talk about target markets again a little bit later, they have incredibly strong brand loyalty. Uh, what are goals of branding for a co-op? In my opinion, um, I think there are four. And it, it's surprising to me that sometimes uh, people think about branding and marketing you know, as something that co-op shouldn't do because it may be too gimmicky. And certainly, marketing can be gimmicky. But I think it's crucial to think about branding as a way, first and foremost, to tell our story. What our clubs are about, how it's going to serve members and shoppers as well as the community. We also want people to um, have positive and meaningful associations with regard to the brand. Those customers who have positive associations are going to be able to not only understand who we are, but articulate who we are to others. And those are the people that have the ability to become really brand ambassadors, to tell your story for you. And we cannot underestimate the impact and effect of that great word of mouth. Um, obviously, people who are more aware of you and like what you're about um, are more likely to be uh, both shoppers and hopefully be transitioned from shoppers to new member owners. And that leads, for us, to a sustainable business. Uh, are there pressing questions before we go on to target markets? No, Kelly, uh, we don't have any yet, so I think, um, I think you've got them just totally spellbound. <laughs> okay. No, I talk fast. I'm sorry. I'll try to slow down. I don't think that's the problem. Um, okay. So target markets. We can get back to this. Uh, a target market is really a key component of your marketing plan. It's critical for developing a successful brand. And in a moment, we're going to take a look at you know, one potential way to think about segmenting um, your customer base. But really, I want to point out the importance to you of avoiding tunnel vision. A lot of businesses misidentify their market or define it um, either too narrowly or too broadly. I think one of the common blind spots that we have um, in college particularly is to assume that um, too many people think like us. Uh, I think that's particularly true when we think of the, um, the people who are the most active in, uh, in co-ops may not be representative of all the shoppers and potential members that we have. So I really caution us to not uh, be too narrow in our, in our definition of our target markets. On the other end of the spectrum, we don't want to be too broad. And being, you know, saying that we want to attract everybody in the community, well, you know, that's an admirable goal. But it makes it really difficult to focus and target your marketing efforts. And, you know, it often lacks the specificity that you're going to need to build your brand identity. So at the end of the day, it's just really important to think very carefully about who your target market is. I highly recommend that you use market research to understand who your uh, cur current, if you're already open, current and potential customers are, um, what they care about, and it probably goes you know, without saying that if you do a bad job of estimating your target market or identifying them, that uh, it's going to have a pretty drastic impact on your bottom line, particularly when you're um, estimating your customer size and translating that into projected sales. One of the things that NCGA um, has used in the past when we think about uh, target market is the Hartman Group's world model. And the Hartman Group is uh, a consulting firm, really, that specializes in uh, both consumer trends and behavior. And I think, uh, yeah, their website is there at www.hartman-group.com. And their model basically describes what motivates shoppers and their purchase decisions. Uh, to sort of summarize it briefly, and I hope I'm doing them justice, they assert that shoppers in any sort of world fall into three categories. Uh, there are individuals that they call the core who are the most active and involved in that world. Um, it's the smallest of the three categories, and these are people who are typically the early adopters. 
customers at the other end in the periphery really maintain only minimal or infrequent and less intensive involvement with whatever the world is. And we will talk about a specific example in a second. But the largest segment by far is what they call the mid-level. And you know, at varying degrees and speeds, the mid-level group does tend to adapt core characteristics, and the periphery group does tend to adapt mid-level characteristics. But at the same time, the core is also changing and adapting new characteristics. So the core tends to be and remain very small and always more cutting edge. And the periphery tends to be and remain sort of people who mm, don't care that much about whatever the topic is. Um, a couple of other interesting notes on the model is that the size of the core, mid-level, and periphery can vary depending on what sort of world you're talking about. But it's important to know that individuals can relate to different worlds differently. So for example, one person might fall into the core when you're talking about the world of convenience, fall into the mid-level when you're talking about the world of organics, and but really still be on the periphery when you're talking about the world of sustainability. So what's driving um, you know, their sort of purchase decisions is very much convenience. They care about organics, but not to the extent that they're going to give up um, you know, the, the quick shop. I'd also say that customer nuances are really important as a result of that. So understanding those nuances in, in your current and target customers can really help ensure that your brand resonates with the intended audience. Um, and you can sort of see, I think, that this model paints a more nuanced picture of customers than you know, assuming that everybody thinks the same across all their purchase decisions. Um, looking at a specific example um, with the world of wellness, it, I guess it may be self-evident to you that those in the, peripher in the periphery excuse me, are least active in the wellness world or least inclined toward a wellness lifestyle. Their key buying factors would probably be traditional features such as price, brand, and convenience. And from a co-op perspective, maybe least likely to shop unless all those factors exist. So they're driven by what we call value versus values. Um, the core group is most active in a wellness world, most inclined toward the wellness lifestyle. So they you know, not only talk the talk, but they walk the walk. Their key buying factors are features such as authenticity, knowledge, and the role of expert opinion. Um, they're probably drawn to co-ops because we do traditionally offer very knowledgeable staff. But they, these people actually know a lot themselves and can play an influencer role on others because they do seek out uh, information and are always looking for the next thing, again, on that cutting edge sort of level. And then thinking about mid-level consumers, they may be experimenting with wellness products or drawn in to wellness, health and wellness lifestyles uh, by a significant event, whether it's uh, becoming parents for the first time or getting a a medical diagnosis that really requires a lifestyle change. These are people that may come into a co-op for a specific product or information. And while they care about the, the bigger picture, uh, they have values, they also tend to be sort of more focused on their personal benefits, the what's in it for me. And they you know, are more likely to make those trade-offs between values and value, at least more readily than a core consumer would. Um, because health and wellness obviously is a, traditionally a, a big point of difference for our members, when we think about marketing, we're thinking about how to provide information and resources that really resonate with mid-level consumers without alienating core consumers. And you know, just looking at the uh, distribution of consumers, you can see that the mid-level group tends to be large. So inviting them in and, and encouraging them to shop in your store can really significantly increase your uh, revenue potential. Uh, questions before I go on to brand architecture? Yeah, we have um, one uh, that's related at least in a question about market research for startups. How, how should a startup group do that? Hire somebody that really knows what they're doing? Um, how can they find the resources for all of this, including surveys? And uh, I, I could partially answer that, but I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. I'm going to say, we actually, in, uh, in CGA, working with uh, both CDS and um, 
SRC, which is a research center at the University of Wisconsin, recently developed uh, what we were considering a standardized uh, shopper, consumer shopper slash member survey. And um, we actually shared the, the, the base model of that survey with Food Cloud 500, and um, it's been modified just slightly to meet the needs of uh, core, or excuse me, of new, uh, new and developing co-ops. So I, unless it's Correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, but I believe that that survey is uh, open to would be open to anyone on the call. Yes, yeah, so the the uh, user's guide is on our website and on our workspace, and I've posted that for anybody to to download and look at. If you do wish to use the survey, I, I ask that you contact me so that we can go over the uh, the data collection and, and the implementation a little bit before you get. And. And so then I would say that, yes, it's going to, you know, for the most part, you're likely to uh, need to work with a research company to uh, help you field and then analyze and sort of summarize the implications of that data. Um, you know, you're going to want to look at what your trade market is in terms of what your likely customer base is. As I said before, it's not likely to be everybody in your community, but it might be, you know, a couple miles up to... I guess 15 or 20 miles, depending on what your um, your community looks like. So they're going to be able to provide the expertise to um, help you answer those questions and figure out really what your best target is. Okay. Um, are you question? Are you going to talk about ways to reach your target market with as a startup? There's limited funds, and uh, the questioner would like to hear some creative ideas, especially when there is no actual storefront present yet. Um, I, mean, I was not going to address that specifically, but a couple of things that come to mind are, you know, it, to the extent that you have, uh, I don't know if you have, a, you could put up a web page to, you know, at least provide access to information on if there are, as a startup, are there. Uh, member meetings, potential member meetings, are there organizing committee meetings, can you, you know, looking for resources when you need help. I mean, I think the web is a great way to access uh, or for people to access information. I also would make sure to um, start developing strong connections with your local media and making sure that that same information gets in the paper in your community pages or in the what's happening section, depending on what you have. Um, those people are <laughs> be really important. Those relationships with media are going to be really important not only in your early uh, marketing and promotion, but in, on an ongoing level. You want to have strong relationships. Invite them in. Uh, you know, take them to lunch. Have coffee with them so that they understand what you're doing, what you're about, what you hope you know, to get from uh, whatever the next phase of your project is, and keep them updated and really work that relationship so that they will come to you. They're not only looking to promote your organization, but in the future, when they're looking for information on the subjects that you've discussed, you're sort of positioned yourself as an expert. Here's the one that I get, uh, I think is very broadly applicable. How useful are student groups such as college marketing classes and other, you know, semi-professional or, or educationally based resources like that? Um, I think for short term help that they can be really uh, useful. I, I don't I wouldn't recommend them as, you know, somebody who's going to come in and develop your brand and then um, make sure that it's executed and, and really in the way that it should be on a long-term basis. If you have a very specific project um, that you don't have, you know, that has a clear start and end, you don't have the resources to ha have your marketing manager in place yet, they can be helpful, but just know that um, you're going to lack some continuity in sort of the trade-off in, in working with those groups. Um, but on the other hand, they are affordable. Many times you can get um, project type work done um, from a student with, you know, a trade off of credit class from the from the professor. Um, but I'd say my recommendation would be to uh, find the resource to ensure that you have continuity, that you have somebody who, you know, has the experience that you need to build your brand and tell your story. Kelly, do you want to keep, t I've got a couple more questions. I don't want to keep you from your presentation. Would you like to? Uh, either way. Or... All right, let me, this one follows on to the last, I guess. What do you think about um, 
a request for proposals uh, amongst professional agencies if you're going to go out and, and just see what you can get that way. I'm a big fan of um, requests for proposals. Um, I also, you know, I'd say depending on the uh, service that I'm looking to provide, I would, my first, you know, thing I would do first is to ask for recommendations from others in the community to see who they, who they, who they have used, um, other co-ops, um, because I, you know, I think that personal experience is really important in identifying an agency that you potentially will be working with for a long time. Um, but I'd say absolutely. Use your request for proposal to narrow your list to, um, just particularly with respect to budget, um, to be really clear that it, you know, on your end it's going to take some work. You have to be clear about what your objective is, what you're trying to get out of it, what your time frame is. Um, I'm trying to think if we have a sample RFP. I'm sure they're available on the website. Um, there are models to follow, and I'd be really clear to make sure that um, you're providing the right information so that you get a good proposal back. All right, one last comment, not a question, but you're not going talking too fast. It's interesting. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. A little reassurance. Um, okay, we'll go on to brand architecture. Okay, so brand architecture, and this is where it gets a little detailed, I'm sorry. Um, a lot of marketing jargon here, but it, it's really the way that you're going to structure your brand. Um, it's going to help you provide clarity around who you are and what you do, and it's going to help you keep your brand experience consistent across all the brand touch points. And touch points is really just anywhere that your customer is going to come in contact with your brand, whether that's inside the store or outside the store. Um, I can't say enough that consistency is really a huge part of great brands. You've got to ensure that you have consistency in every way in which you communicate. So back to our Apple example, you know, if you want to convey that you're hip, creative, and modern, then that has implications for your appro approach to what you do, whether it's print advertising, your website, your TV ads, the staff that you employ, the events that you host, et cetera. Uh, again, reinforcing that it's, everything has to come back to supporting and reinforcing the brand, the message that you want to convey. We're going to go into these components a little more in detail. So your brand position is really how you want your target market to think about your brand relative to competitors. It reflects your unique value and should differentiate you in the market. So you have to think about what are the equities or attributes or benefits that you offer or want to stand for. A brand position statement also typically identifies your target market. So, you know, and there are some standard ways to write this, and I just give you some examples of what it could be. I'm just making these up. Um, but for example, um, for core and mid-level wellness consumers, ABC Co-op is the brand that inspires them to live well by eating well. So there we have, who's the target? Core and mid-level wellness. What's the brand? ABC Co-op. You know, what are you trying to provide? What's the value for you? You want to inspire them to live well and eat well. Um, another sort of made-up one um, for members. ABC Co-op is a brand that offers great food in a way that considers the health and well-being of people on planet. Or ABC Co-op is a brand that serves members and improves community through sustainable food and business practices. There's a lot, I mean, a lot of ways that you can go here. It's, it's up to you. What is your vision? What is your mission? What's important to your consumers? That's um, You want to mesh those things into a statement that is your brand position statement, really. And the four, as I said, I should have said earlier, with respect to architecture, is that this is really inter these are internal statements. As you, <laughs> as, as words I just gave you are not friendly. I'd never put them on a, an ad or in a poster. Um, you know, you have to translate your brand position into a meaningful message for consumers. So these are internal looking statements. Um, okay, your brand promise. Really, the brand promise is sort of a more concise version of your position statement, but it's from a consumer standpoint. It needs to really 
communicate concisely what it is you expect to own and deliver on in the minds of consumers. It obviously needs to be important to your target, should be unique, and again, differentiating you from the competitor, and also be achievable. Um, it's something that every time they walk into your store, they're going to come away with X, and it doesn't have to be a tangible thing. Thinking about an example of this, um, you can go this. Okay, um, Target. For those of you who shop at Target, um, their position may say something, I think their tagline is, uh, what is expect more and pay less, or get more, pay less, or something like that. Um, so their position statement may say that they want to be the brand that delivers more for less for consumers. But what consumers are going to take away, what the brand promise is, is more like affordable chic. So it's you know the same sort of uh, idea, but in a consumer-friendly way, what I think of from from the consumer standpoint. Um, for co-ops, you know, again, this uh, can be trusted source. It can be local organic and healthy food. Um, people profit. Um, or, sorry, people before profit. Um, again, it's going to be unique to your co-op and what's uh, differentiating you in the marketplace. Brand essence is uh, it's really it's typically a two or three word phrase that really captures the heart and soul of you. It's timeless and enduring. Um, it's you know I guess the easiest way to think about this is what's your elevator statement? You're you know in an elevator with somebody who knows nothing about your brand. What are you going to say? And there's lots of great examples of this. Um, if thinking back to our Apple example, they might be innovative and imaginative design. Um, what's another one? Um, Hallmark, I guess, is caring shared. I think that's actually their slogan, too. Um, Nature Conservancy, for example, might be about saving great places. Um, Disney, there's great, fun family entertainment. So this is like, what, what would I say in two or three words to communicate what we're about? Brand personality is the, if you were to personify your brand, again, what would that brand look like as a person? For Apple, um, you know, some of those words that came up earlier were hip, creative. Um, you'd probably say passionate. The person would probably be stylish, um, just based on the aesthetically pleasing design of all of their products. Uh, if you looked at somebody on sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, I don't know if anybody rides a bike, but Harley Davidson, you know, the Harley Davidson person is probably, you know, a little more rugged, a little more macho, um, maybe more adventurous, and, you know, somebody who really enjoys um, the sort of the spirit of freedom. Um, the character traits, those are the things that really attract your customers and what they should ex experience, again, when they come in contact with your brand. So if you walk into an Apple store, you know, what is it about that environment that's going to be hip creative and stylish? If you walk into a Harley Davidson store, what is it about that store that's going to be, you know, sort of playful and adventurous and embody that idea of freedom? Um, it really is about, you know, taking those things that are a reflection of your customers and their aspirations and um, reflecting it back for them. So who, who do they aspire to be? A lot of times we think about what our customers are now, and we miss what it is that they are, you know, what, what is aspirational, what emotionally is connecting with them. Um, I think one of the great things that co-ops have to offer in terms of brand personality that I'd like to see us play up a little more is this sense of passion. I mean, we are, as a group, really passionate about what we do, and that, I think, um, is a very compelling attribute and or personality trait. I don't know how you want to characterize it, but it's something that I come into contact with in my interactions with our co-op members on a daily basis, and I'm sure that our co-op members are too, and there's a way that we can um, make that more self-evident in the other things that we do. Uh, brand touch points, again, all the places where the customers are going to experience your brand and your brand promise, everything from your newsletter um, to 
your store, how your products are merchandised, your marketing materials, your member materials, their interactions with staff, um, some of the, well, we'll talk about individual uh, touch points again, but the, I guess the important thing to remember here is that some touch points are more important than others depending on the customer. So those touch points do vary in importance um, based on the customer. Some people are going to be all about the web and what's up there and, you know, why don't you have more information? And other people want it all in the store. I want to find out, you know, find what I want when I want it just in the store. That's it. So you have to take in those sort of conflicting, sometimes conflicting or uh, disparate needs of all of your consumers. Um, more about brand touch points, they really can be divided in, for our purposes, I think, into three main sections. There's the pre-purchase um, experience and ways you might reach people uh, before they're in the store, purchase experience, and then post-purchase. Um, really, the, this is just to sort of illustrate to you again that um, there are various ways that you can touch people, and um, it's certainly not uh, exhaustive list. There are other things that you might want to add. Uh, for example, looking at the younger generation and the proliferation of sort of um, social media and how that's sort of taken off among uh, the Gen Y group, I would certainly add Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms as examples of touch points that could and should be added um, to fit into really, I'd say, the, both the pre- and post-purchase um, experience areas. I think it's really important to prioritize those touch points or understand the priority of importance for your members and consumers because that can help you identify how you prioritize your own time, effort, and I guess budget allocation to those areas. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, an ad might be great to get people in the store. Um, a a follow-up thank you might be a great way to uh, you know, thank people for the purchase or for their participation in a survey. Um, but a lot of uh, how our brand comes across, in my opinion, is really in that purchase experience realm, what people experience when they're in the store. Um, I think the conventional touch points or even unconventional sort of guerrilla marketing um, can both be very valuable in reaching target markets. A lot of the ways that consumers find out about us for the first time, I think, are in some of those out-of-store events, whether uh, we're participating in fairs or um, holding, you know, the farmer's market, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, I guess another thing that I would recommend as you think about touch points and branding is to look at how other brands are playing out. I think a competitive audit is a great way to do this. Um, if your store is up and running now, I would be sure that you audit and ask others to audit your own store. Um, it really, it doesn't have to be a, thinking about competitive audits, it doesn't have to be a grocery when you go out and think about um, how people are, are, are touching consumers and the messages that are coming across to you. You can look at uh, retailers in a variety of businesses, and really I do it along a spectrum of people that you consider to be both good and poor retailers. Um, it helps identify, I think, the brand treatments that you find effective, as well as the things that you'll want to avoid. Um, I think I have maybe just a slide or two more, but I'm happy to stop for questions. I have one for that last slide. Um, if, for a startup group, and we're looking at that last chart with the, with the pre-purchase experience, how would you prioritize some of the options there? Um, again, always looking at limited budgets. Sure. Uh, I think a lot of this actually could be combined. For example, if I were doing a direct mail or an advertisement, I could easily um, add in there, you know, I would be promoting my deal, whatever deals I have going on. Um, put a coupon in your ad. I think that, that there's no problem in doing that as long as you're um, consistent with your ad treatment and communicating the rest of your uh, brand message. I certainly um, think that that can be an effective way of drawing in consumers who are looking for deals. I would say that I would not, you know, have as my sole advertising strategy um, to always just put in the deal. There's got to be, I think, more message behind it than, than, than the promotion, or people may be disappointed when they come in. Um, 
and find that not everything is on sale. Um, I, I personally think that if, if I were uh, involved in a startup uh, co-op, I would recommend direct mail um, over advertising at first. I think advertising can be effective, but again, it's very sort of um, mass market oriented. Um, it's, you can't target it very effectively. I think that direct mail, although it can be more expensive on a, on a per uh, consumer basis, can be much more effective in making sure that you're getting to the consumers that you think um, are your likely, you know, most likely to shop in your store and or become members. Um, and then I think you know the, whole, the the issue with coupons and incentives I think is something to evaluate sort of um, as you look at your position in the market. If you are looking at other retails and recognize that you are sort of the price leader, is that uh, the position that you're comfortable with? Is that one that you want to start to refute you know right away? I think it's sort of um, scenario specific and how I would deal with the desire to, to put out a lot of coupons and incentives. Um, other than what you know, you may already be offering to members in your membership packet. How soon do you want to should a group start developing its brand? Uh, from, from my standpoint, uh, the brand is part of the marketing plan. That's part of the business plan. That um, I think any banker <laughs> would want to see in making. Um, a decision on whether to provide funding. So I, I say it's never too early um, to start developing the brand. I really think it's crucial to just every decision that you make from the people that you hire to um, you know the layout of the store to the, the sorts of merchandising uh, displays that you purchase. Um, it really impacts every decision. Can, can and should impact every decision. But, One more question. You know, that said, if you haven't developed your brand yet, don't panic. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, it's never too early. Let me just leave it at that. One more question then: Is there a danger of a food co-op appearing to be over-marketed or to look too slick? I, there is a complaint that another large food co-op in an urban metropolitan area doesn't seem small and friendly anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's interesting. Um, I, I guess my first response to that would be that I don't personally believe that size um, is tied to your ability to effectively brand yourself. For me, um, you know, it's more about whether you've adequately trained your staff, whether you have enough staff to serve customer needs, whether you are truly listening and reflecting back um, feedback that you get and uh, involving members and shoppers in decisions, um, I guess members primarily, but um, giving people a chance for input and, and um, again, reflecting that back. So I don't buy that um, it's, that size can't be, you know, a great, small, community-friendly feel um, when you're in the store. I, I do think that um, it's important to understand, you know, who your customers are and what re what resonates with them. Certainly, um, slick happens. I mean, I've, I've, they, there are things that I see um, lots of brands see that don't necessarily appeal to me as an individual. Um, but I don't think that uh, small or co-op has to equate to you know a, a 60s type font or um, no advertising, or and you know, I guess some of the other stereotypes that might exist. I think it's more in how you are executing your brand um, through everything you do than just what your ad looks like. Which is not to say that you won't ever get feedback from members. I mean, you can ask any co-op. <laughs> I'm sure it's a member of NCGA, and um, there's somebody who's not going to like what you do. So you have to remember, obviously, that you cannot please 100% of the people 100% of the time. You have to be comfortable with, you know, where your brand is with respect to is it fulfilling, you know, what you as an organization have a mission to do. 
and then be able to educate others so that they can help communicate decisions that are made or why decisions are made or why it looks like this, which was, you know, red over blue because whatever. Um, and just know that that's sometimes the best you can do is provide an explanation, thank people for their feedback. I, um, I have a couple more questions that have come in, but uh, do you, would you like to go back to your presentation? Um, sure. Well, okay. Whatever you prefer. I really only have one more slide. Should I go on? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Oh. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this. Um, I wanted to sort of wrap it up with this idea of execution and the thought that really commitment to the brand means uh, empowering a brand champion who's going to be able to take, you know, your vision, um, build your brand, your brand architecture, and translate it into those sort of more specific brand standards, which I didn't go into <laughs> because I thought that might fry everyone's brain. Um, but once you have your brand architecture, you then have to translate it into specific standards and a branding guide that is going to specify pretty clearly um, to everyone so there's no mistake about how your brand is and should be communicated and that person also then is responsible for updating those materials as your customer base and or your business evolves. So, you know, things like logo standards, color standards, whether people can create handwritten signs, um, what are the messages, the verbal sort of toolbox uh, that people can use, um, what are your general standards for newsletters, uh, for mailings, or your website, uh, the graphics that you're going to use, both from the standpoint of you know, the products that you showed, the people, um, and other graphic elements. So there's sort of a, a definitely another more complex level to branding that um, is going to take somebody who's, whose job it is to make sure that it's executed. And I'll say again that the commitment really has to be at the senior level to executing those standards in all aspects of the business. It's, you know, marketing is, is responsible, I think, for executing a brand, but I think leadership, the general manager's responsibility is to make sure that everybody is held to um, executing against that brand. Um, the brand, I guess, the, again, the most important thing I could say is the brand is what your customer experiences. And it's more than just those marketing elements. Um, it's about your operations and how the store is managed. The marketing elements are important. But I can say all that I want in an ad. And if the experience that that customer has when they walk in the store differs, it doesn't matter. Because um, you know there's that dissonance between what they've been led to expect and what they actually experience. So if you've got friendly smiling faces um, on your signage around the store, you're going to want to have friendly smiling faces at checkout. Um, so your promises and your execution are sort of aligned. Um, last, I would say that maintaining the brand, I think, is really a dynamic process. It's not something that has to be static. Um, I do highly recommend that you're doing research on your customer base, both current and for your target customers, and see how their expectations and needs are changing over time, because you do have to sort of adjust accordingly. Not necessarily the essence of, of what you are, um, but you can, uh, up, you know, be sort of updated with the times, um, because your brand is not really meant to be rigid. It's, it's supposed to be um, reflect who you are in your organization, certainly, it isn't a rigid, um, sort of static uh, thing. So I, the last thing I had is some, some resources. Again, I would encourage anyone to feel free to contact me if they have uh, need a resource that may not be listed here. So we have some uh, great research uh, resources for secondary market research. There's samples for marketing plans, and I can we have a, a branding guide that you know, could be useful there as well. And then there's some looking at if you're interested in non-co-op brand standards. I'm sure there are many examples of brand standards on Seedman sites, but non-co-op brand standards. There's a few examples here for people interested in an actual sample. 
Great. Would you like a, a few more questions then? Yeah, sure. Okay. You talked about brand essence being two or three words that describe you. If you have a tagline, would that be the equivalent of the brand essence? Or is that something different? Yeah, I think a brand um, a tagline can be your brand essence, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, you really have to think about what's you know, going to resonate the most with your customers. Um, thinking about like Nike, for example, like, their tagline is just do it. So, but their brand essence, like what they're really about, is probably something more like, you know, um, true athletic performance or, um, you know, what the customer is looking for out of that. Um, Caring Shares, though, I think is an example of one that is both a tagline and a slogan. I believe that Hallmark uses uh, that as their tagline, and I'd say it, it pretty well encompass, encompasses what their brand essence is. They want, you know, to be able to share feelings, you know, through Hallmark. Um. Is there a risk of choosing a brand too soon and then having to change it later? Um, choosing a, I, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that question. I guess um, it sort of it sort of presupposes to me like that um, you haven't done your work. I mean, assuming you've done your work on uh, who your potential target is, your target market. You've done the work from an organizational standpoint with respect to what your mission is, what your vision is. Um, those things should be translatable into a brand um, when you consider them, you know, those, those things together. So I, I would tend to say no. I mean, what I would uh, caution against is to you know have one discussion um, based on limited information and say our brand is going to be X, and then not be able to test that back against um, your you know whatever applicable staff there might be, um, whatever applicable members and shoppers. Um, there are ways that you know if you have any questions on what you're doing, whether it's something very detailed like execution of a logo or um, a message, that you could just pull in the focus group and see how people are reacting to it. Um, so you don't have to do these things in a vacuum or without some, you know, ability to, to reflect off against your potential shoppers and uh, potential new members. Hopefully I understood the question. I apologize if I didn't. <laughs> um, the, uh, just to make sure we cover this one, you you'd mentioned earlier that people were welcome to email you with follow-up questions later. Uh, um, can yeah, you, you bet. Make sure we get your email somewhere. Um, I can put it out to as an answer here. I think everybody would see it, or if you have an easy way to put it up. Um, um, how do I? Well, if you, I could put it up. It's case Smith at MCGA. Stop the show. Nope. Here, I'll stop the show and write it. All right. Uh, isn't technology one? It doesn't have to. Yeah, the K. I don't think it doesn't have to be capitalized. It just auto-corrected that. All right. But it'll work either way. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Yeah. The uh, what about profiling members and using that kind of information towards marketing and promotion? Um, if it is a good idea, how would you recommend approaching it? There's some people are sensitive about profiling, obviously, but it seems like it could be helpful in identifying your market and promoting a startup. Yeah, you know, um, I think if you're, it's certainly I would include your early members on um, all the research that you're hopefully going to be doing around uh, assessing who your target market is. But I'd be, you know, really careful that you're, um, you may 
especially in a startup situation, with your early members only be reaching that core group, uh, the people who are, you know, know everything about a co-op, what it is, they get it, they're going to, you know, be in there shopping on a daily, weekly, you know, whatever the regular basis is, and miss um, those people who may not be as familiar with what a co-op is, may have a, you know, a steeper learning curve, they need to be enticed in. Um, so understanding what those uh, target or potential customers um, their attitudes and lifestyles and um, interests are, I think, is a really important part of the process. So I would hate to have uh, a co ops exclude that piece of the picture and then sort of struggle with, well, you know, we're meeting the needs of those early adapters or early members, but for whatever reason we can't get new members, you know, we're not, we don't have as many shoppers into the co ops as we need. And so I think that's a real risk um, because those groups could be, you know, really pretty different. And one of the challenges, obviously, that we have in marketing is finding ways to really keep those core members engaged and um, at the same time communicate what seems to a core member very sort of basic information. Um, so we always sort of try to find that balance in the middle and, and find ways, I think, what we have struggled to do in the past, but is to find a way to engage those um, or the core co-ops, looking at the world co-op, core co-opers um, to become brand ambassadors in a way that isn't um, sort of off-putting to people who may not share the same passion. They're just not there yet um, about co-ops. So it's, it's a challenge that we'll continue to try to tackle. Um. Will the slides a, uh, be posted later to the registration site along with the recording? Do you know yet whether that's planned? Yes, Stuart, that will be planned and they'll be available starting uh, Friday afternoon. All right, great. Uh, those For those of you who have participated in other workshops or have not been able to and wish you could have, most of them are recorded and most of the slide presentations and other uh, review documents are on the site where you registered and can be downloaded. Um, I think I've got only one more question. Is, do you have any opinions about hiring marketing help from out of state? Um, I, I don't know if I would say I wouldn't have any problem with it. Um, I think, you know, the great thing about marketing is if you understand the fundamentals, I think it translates well to any business. Um, you know, certainly there's a potential expense associated with um, finding somebody from out of state, and there are, I'd say, benefits to the extent that you can find the expertise locally to having somebody who understands your market and your community. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have to weigh those sort of benefits and disadvantages against um, your ability to find a qualified person. And I would not um, not hire somebody because I couldn't find somebody local. Okay. I spoke too soon. And I several... wouldn't hesitate to hire somebody who was out of state, I guess, okay. if they were the, had you know the qualifications that I was looking for. Right. Uh, is, is the knowledge of your specific market going to be a problem there? You know, I don't, I don't feel like it, it is. Um, I think people become acclimated to their communities really quickly, um, particularly somebody who's invested in making those connections as a marketing um, and or outreach person would, um, in forming relationships with other um, sort of like-minded organizations uh, and local media. It really is their job to understand, you know, your community and find ways to promote the co-op uh, and the things that are happening. So. Um, I'd certainly say somebody who's sort of homegrown may have a, um, a a leg up, but again, I wouldn't, you know, if I was really struggling um, to find somebody and there didn't seem to be talent available locally, I I wouldn't hesitate to hire somebody from out of state. Okay. Um, how do demographics and market study results inform your definition of the target market? Uh, I, I think it's um, definitely a component. Um, 
see, you know, you have to look at both demographics and sort of what we would consider psychographics. So, you know, what people, how they shop, what they're looking for, how frequently um, they're shopping, what's important to them when they're shopping. Um, but demographics, I think, um, is pretty important, particularly when it comes to product selection. I think what we're finding in some of uh, our member costs, particularly as they're expanding into additional stores, um, that their customer base is a little different from an, um, particularly from an ethnic standpoint. And so that um, really, I think, impacts your decisions around, you know, maybe I, we do need to bring in some of these more specialty or ethnic focused uh, foods that we wouldn't have considered in our other store. So it's, it's one element that needs to be considered, um, but not the only one. Um, we had one inquiry as to whether you'd be willing to take a look at logos, mission statements, PowerPoints, and things like that, uh, review them for, for people. Wow. Um, I'd love to look at that stuff. I, I would say, wow, oh, um, to the extent that I have free time, if somebody was really in desperate need, I'd do my best to assist. I'm not sure my boss will love me for that. Um, also, even though I am no expert on it, I'm certainly willing to take a look at things also for people and, and comment to the best of my own knowledge. Um, and I would just say, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Sure, I just, you know, what I will say, you know, whether in this group or to somebody individually, is that, you know, I am just one person. And so while I represent a specific, you know, sort of subset of people like me, also consider that, you know, I am just representative of a small group. So um, as guilty as marketers may be of thinking everybody thinks like them, um, too, we try really hard to encourage you not to just, you know, take my opinion, for example. But, work, you know, take with, you know your co-op and what you're going to be about better than, than I will, but I am happy to to help when I can. Um, should marketing strategies be applied to owner drives as well, like membership or even, I suppose, member loan drives could fit in there? Any particular ways you would do that? So I'm sorry, repeat the question? Yeah, whether marketing strategies can and should be applied to owner member owner drives. Well, I'd, I'd say certainly. I mean, um, I think member owner drives are, you know, just a little more focused on um, converting those shoppers, but they should be consistent with, you know, the brand for the architecture and what you said you want to do. So thinking about your, your member packet and the materials that you um, are making available, whether it's, um, you know, sort of what your co-op is about, at the customer service desk or your direct mail pieces um, that are specifically targeted around ownership. Um, it all needs to be consistent and in alignment. And I'm not sure, maybe if there's a, I think there may be more to that question that I'm not quite getting, but um, if the person who wrote it wanted to be more specific, I'd be happy to say more. Okay. Um. I'll wait and see if that comes in. In the meantime, uh, we've there. I'll just read this one. We found that people are interested in local and healthy foods, but they don't seem to care whether or not it comes from a co-op. How do you get beyond that roadblock and turn them into members? Yeah, I think um, you know. For me, this is the uh, question of. Are you positioning yourself solely around product selection, or are you positioning yourself as you know something broader than that? I think the position that many clubs find themselves in is that their point of differentiation in the market, and you know what they sort of rallied around was we're the place to get natural organic foods, and for a long time we were the only place to get natural organic foods. Um, but you know, in competition is increasing to say the least, you can get natural organic foods anywhere. And so for me, it's um, not about the products necessarily that we buy. And in fact, I think that there, or that we provide, I think that there are markets where um, 
you know, it certainly makes sense, and we have many examples of this um, where costs are sort of providing a more crossover selection, if you will, between conventional natural and organic, because that's what their community, their members, and their shoppers want and need. And so um, it's about providing, you know, the answer to what really is our position, uh, what makes us unique, and I would suggest that it goes beyond those um, the products that you carry into the, um, you know, the, the support for community, um, the support for local. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that you may decide to differentiate yourself, but uh, for me it's more the values proposition than the, the product selection. Okay. Um, well, a comment that I think is, is a good, well taken, uh, that uh, for evaluating the materials that you're developing, student groups and uh, university type uh, projects can be a good resource for feedback. Mm -hmm. That seem reasonable? I would, I would concur. You've got, oh boy, we're just, we're stimulating thought here, I think, which is good. Um, some of these are getting lengthy, and I'll try to see if I can find the correct answer or the correct question. On owner drive marketing, as a follow-up question, I think this is the, the previous question. Um, most of what you said applies to retail operations and must be considered and applied at each of the three main stages. And I, I believe that's referring to the development stages of our model. A failure to consider consistency of message and brand must be applied to organizing and pre-opening owner drives. Um, a, a bad mismatched menagerie of incompetent and contradictory volunteers could kill an owner drive in its tracks. Marketing isn't advertising, but it's present in every stage and every person from hour zero. That's more of a comment, I guess, than a question, but your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I cannot agree more. Okay. But you know, it, certainly you have to educate whatever you know brand position um, you're going to take has to be communicated to everybody involved at every level. And um, I've seen time and time again, uh, you know, well-meaning but misinformed volunteer um, do a lot of damage to a, a brand or at least a, a single customer's interaction with that brand. Um, for lack of information, or for for you know espousing um, a, a personal position versus an organization position. Right. Well, I think we've covered uh, and caught up. Thank you, Kelly. That was a great presentation. I, I think you really touched a nerve for a lot of people that are out there today. I can. Um, I know some of the people that posted these questions, and, and they clearly were, were getting a lot out of it. Right. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, Kelly, I'd also like to thank you very much. I was monitoring the questions as they were coming in, and, and a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of good comments um, about the information that you were providing. So thank you very much. And I especially appreciate your offer to stay in touch with folks, and uh, appreciate that you were making that generously. and. And, and we understand that that's in the context of uh, a, a, a full set of duties that you already have. And so we, we very much appreciate that and will understand as you, you try to balance all your various responsibilities. So thank you again. I believe there are no further questions. Uh, we'll be closing the webinar if that is in, indeed true. And, and be sure and uh, come again next week for hiring your first general manager with Carolee Coulter. Uh, Stuart, before I sign off, are there other, is there anything else uh, that you would like for us to cover, or are there any more questions? No, I just encourage everybody to keep an eye on our website and sign up for our Food Co-op 500 workspace if you haven't already, uh, where you can get the most up-to-date information out there. <laughs>